You've invested countless hours to develop your own website and you're just afraid that some hacker on the internet would just deface it. In this video, I'm going to show you how hackers find vulnerabilities inside your website, exploit them and then deface your website. But why I bother doing that? Well, I myself had this background voice whenever I was developing something that some hacker somehow would be able to attack it. And that was like the motivation for me to start learning how to write secure code. Throughout this video, you're going to witness some hacking techniques. Don't test them on websites that you don't have permission to attack. Imagine this is your website. You're so happy about it. You've published it. I'm going to show you exactly how I would go about finding vulnerabilities here and uh, exploit them and deface this website. So what hackers generally do when they first start attacking a website is just using it normally. They would visit every link, every page and every feature that you're website or web application offers. So here we can see we have about experience, um, education, we have the interests of this web developer. He is an avid skier, a novice ice climber. He does a lot of outdoors activities. I would say he is a healthy uh, developer and he has a bunch of awards. So we're up against, I would say, a senior developer here and he has a bunch of social media links which point to nothing from his website. Okay, I'm also going to look for the source code behind it. It's not the server side code, but just the HTML code that powers this web page. And as you can see here, we have a bunch of links that we didn't see in uh, the manual enumeration part. For example, we can see that we have the profile image which is hosted under the IMG folder. So if I go here to the same path, I get the picture profile of the developer. Now, what happens if I remove this part right here? Would I access other files potentially? Let's see. Oh, we have what we call a directory listing, which means that we have a list of files under this directory. And fortunately for this developer, he only had one picture image under this folder. So let's go back to the source and continue our enumeration. I don't see anything interesting here, just a bunch of classes and IDs and HTML tags. Yeah, he is a senior developer, by the way. We have a bunch of libraries like jQuery, Bootstrap, which are hosted under the vendor folder. So I wonder if I could go directly to that. And yes, I can. Fortunately for the developer, these are just JavaScript libraries. So the best thing that we could achieve here is just a cross-site scripting. Um, I'm not really interested in that. I just want to deface the website. And to do that, I would need something on the server side. So the first thing you notice is that if you have a directory listing configured on your website, just go ahead and disable it. Otherwise, hackers might gain access to other files if they're hosted on under that directory. I don't see any attack surface here, so I want to discover more. This is generally what hackers do. And how to do that? Brute force. So I'm going to brute force this part here to see if there are any uh, folders which are not available as links. These could be hidden portals, upload folders, etc. So I'm going to use WFuzz for that. And I'm interested in fuzzing this part right here under the host name. So this would be this part right here. All right, we've already found CSS images in JS folders, uh, but we have something new, development. That's an interesting folder, which might contain other interesting features, probably vulnerable to something. But uh, as you can see here, the response code is 401, which means that it's unauthorized. So if I go to development, as you can see, I'm prompted with a login, username and a password. I don't have them. Maybe I can try something like admin, admin or admin password. If you're a developer and you have a portal with such username and password, just go ahead, pause the video and change them right now. So let's cancel for now and let's see if we have anything more interesting. While this is running, I'm also going to build a custom word list 
which I'm going to use to brute force the login and password for the development portal. There's a handy tool that's called cool. So I'm going to target my website and I'm going to extract any words that have four characters minimum. Hit enter. And just like that, we have 246 words. Take a look at this file. As you can see, we have words like development, words, media, and to brute force it, we can use uh, a tool called Hydra. And uh, let's use the username uh, admin. You know what? Um, let's go ahead and create a list of logins. Uh, let's try admin. Let's try Frank, dev, and that would be it. So we're targeting the development folder and capital P for the list of passwords and cross our fingers. So we're trying all these passwords with the username admin, frank and dev, but we don't have a hit. So let's continue. As an attacker, when I hit a roadblock, I do more enumeration. And this website is hosted on a server. And part of the things an attacker always does is port scanning. So I'm going to target this website with Nmap and see if I can find any open ports that I can exploit. And right away, we see that we have indeed three ports, 21 for FTP, 80 for HTTP. This is the website that we've been testing so far. And we have SSH port 22. So I'm going to start with 21, see if I find anything interesting. So I'm going to use FTP and one misconfiguration I see developers do is open FTP for guests. The username is anonymous and the password could be whatever you want. Oh, I can indeed log in. All right, let's see what we have. Doesn't seem to have anything in it. Can I list something from the root directory? No. So the developer hasn't put anything interesting in this server. So let's uh, go back to our port scanning. We have SSH, so let's try with SSH. Uh, maybe use the username Frank. And yes, let's accept the fingerprint. And it's asking us for a password. Let's type Frank or admin or password, but none of them work. But nonetheless, we have the possibility to authenticate as Frank using a password. This is not a good configuration you should have on your SSH server. Always use a public key to prevent any password brute force, which we're going to do just now. So just like the uh, brute force that we've done using Hydra on the development portal, I'm going to do the same thing, but this time using SSH. So I'm going to use SSH and target the website. I'm going to use those words. And for the usernames, I'm going to try admin, uh, Frank and dev. Yeah, why not? Let's hit enter. And we don't have any hits, unfortunately, or fortunately for the developer. Oh, we have another port. 8011, which also hosts um, a website here that was fingerprinted as Apache. So let's visit that website. Oh, development server. Okay. What do we have in the HTML code? Nothing. Hmm. Okay. Let's uh, use once more brute force. Okay. We have API. So while WFuzz is running, let's go to that slash API and see what we have. I think this is hosted on index.html. Yep. So index.html under API hosts um, this web page, which tells us that there are some files under API. Let's try them. Web underscore API. Oh, not found. Okay. Records API. Let's cross our fingers. And not found. Okay. What about files underscore API? Oh, we have something here. No parameter called file passed to me. Note, this API doesn't use JSON, so send the file name in raw format. This is generally what we see in a development um, website, verbose messages and um, yeah, you know, the website is not configured for the production. And so we have a lot of hints. Let's go to burp and play with this request and see if we can get something from it. Let's pass in this file parameter like this, hit send. 
and we can see that the message has changed. Hacker detected. What about post? Hacker detected. Same thing. Instead of sending it in the get parameter, let's send it here. File equals. Hit send. Okay. The message has changed and it seems that it doesn't recognize the file parameter that we've sent here. And that's generally because I guess we haven't provided it with the right content type. A hacker always loves to tinker with those requests. Content type would be URL encoded and let's send it. Okay, we have no errors now. Let's see index.html, for example. If I render the page, as you can see, this is the web page. Okay, but can I load files that are not under the web root? This is what attackers do. They use the feature as it is, try to make it work, and then try to bypass restrictions and access unauthorized files. Okay, we have a list of uh, users here from the etc passwd, which is outside the web root. This is known as a local file inclusion vulnerability. So now that we have this, what can we do? Well, if we take a wild guess and say that main website is hosted under var www.html. Um, let's try with index.html. Oh, we have nothing. Maybe an older version and remove the HTML part. Oh, okay. We have the content of the main website, as you can see here. We'll render it for you, the experience, different parts of the website. So this means that the main website is hosted under var www. This goes to say that the development portal is under development right now. So if we send this, uh, we get nothing because we need uh, a file under development. So if we try index.html, let's see. Oh, we have something here. My development tools. Okay, here's my unfinished tools list, the uploader tool. So we've essentially bypassed the authentication and accessed the index.html file. Perfect. So it seems that we need to uh, brute force this part right here to see if we can gain access to additional features. Hackers are always looking for additional features that they can abuse. So uh, let's send this to the intruder and I'm going to add a placeholder right here. And since the application is developed in PHP, uh, I'm going to take a wild guess and search for only PHP files. And let's, um, let's go ahead and define our payloads and let's give it a try. So we have pretty much the same length here for results which don't have a valid page behind them, but uh, hopefully we would have bigger response here if we hit a file that exists under the development portal. And it seems we have nothing. Let's go back to our local file inclusion. There is a cool PHP wrapper, expect like this and the command. In this case, I'm going to run the command ID. If everything goes well, if we were lucky, we should get the result. Let's send. Nothing, okay. Maybe we can try to sleep for five seconds. And we have a response right away, which means that we can't really use this to run arbitrary code. Okay, we still had another file called database underscore API and oh bummer, it doesn't return anything. Okay, it seems that we hit once again a roadblock and when we hit a roadblock using enumeration. But before I do that, I'm just going to see if I have something under development called HTPassWD. This holds the hash for the user to access the development portal and we have nothing. So let's go back to the beginning. So instead of targeting the um, files and folders, I'm going to target this time extensions. So I'm going to use index and I'm going to use the word list small extensions. Hit enter. So we already have .html. Oh, we have also .html.back. Cool. Let's use curl and target index.html.back. What the hell? There's a comment here that says I will use Frank and this hash as the .htpasswd file to protect the development path. 
Oh, okay, so it seems that this is the hash I was talking about, freely delivered to us in a backup file. So developers, you should never leave behind things like that. Never use those extensions to save your old code. Always use version control. So with that said, we can go ahead and uh, crack this hash right here. So I'm going to copy it to my hashcat folder. And it seems that it was cracked. Look at this. The password is Frank with three explanation marks. Developers, you should never ever use guessable and predictable passwords. So we're going to use Frank as the username and Frank with three explanation marks. And we land on the same page that we had before. Here is my unfinished tool list, the uploader tool, blah, blah, blah. But this time we can go ahead and brute force the paths here and hope that we find something interesting. So I'm going to grab this header right here. I'm going to use it in WFuzz. So as you can see, these are just step-by-step -step simple tasks that attackers follow in a methodical approach in order to find weak points on your website and exploit them. So we have index, okay. Oh, we have another one, uploader. I think that's the uploader tool that the developer was talking about, not a platter, uploader. Oh, we land on a file upload feature. Okay, so I'm just curious to know if I can access the same page here from the local file inclusion vulnerability I had before. And uh, no, I don't get access to it. All right, let's see if we have index.html here, we would see it. Ah, all right, I needed to add index.html at the end to brute force directories. So that's why I couldn't get it using the local file inclusion. Perfect. All right, let's test this uh, file upload feature and see if we can abuse it. I'm going to try directly uploading a PHP file and see what we get. Upload image. File is not an image, sorry. Only JPEG, JPEG, PNG, or GIF are allowed. Okay, the file was not uploaded. uploaded. This is a classic protection that we will attempt to bypass and see if we are lucky that the developer did not properly code this feature. So I'm going to go back and uh, upload another file, which would be just a test JPEG image. Upload it. File is a JPEG. Okay, it detected it as a JPEG file and it has been uploaded to my uploads path. Okay, but it doesn't say which upload path is. What is the upload path? It might be under uploads. Nope, there is no folder called uploads. Maybe just upload. Nope, we don't have anything. Um, okay, let's go back to our burp and play with the request. The first step here is just to upload something malicious and then we will find uh, how we can locate it on the server. Uh, so this is my request, I guess. Yep, send this to the repeater. So the first thing I can do is copy this content type right here in disposition and put them in my previous request. This is to see if the developer checks only for the MIME type and the extension. We send this, file is not an image. Okay, so it really goes ahead and inspects the content of the file. Well, we can just take that PHP from here. So copy it and paste it just after the image right here. If we send it, uh, what do we have here? File is an image. Uh, yeah, file already exists. Okay. It tests if the file already exists. In this case, we already have uploaded test.jpg. So I'm going to maybe use uh, zero. Let's use JPEG like this and send it. And it was uploaded. Now the question is, where is this file? Because if we can find the location of the file, we can leverage the previous vulnerability, the local file inclusion, to point right to it. Because the server is evaluating our file as a PHP code, then it will go through that and see, oh, I have a PHP code here. I'm going to run it. And we would get the response here. But uh, let's not get ahead of ourselves and uh, try to find where this upload folder might be. The developer just loves patterns. So why don't we play the game and uh, 
guess his pattern. So let's say, um, maybe it's Frank and then upload. Nope. Uh, okay. Well, just to be 100% sure that we find the right file, we know that the file has been uploaded, right? And the file is called 0.jpg. So I'm going to take that and put it right here just to make sure that we have indeed our file back if we find the right folder. So up, Frank upload doesn't work. What about flat Frank uploads? No, okay, maybe underscore uploads or dash uploads, maybe uh, dash upload or maybe underscore upload. Nope. Okay, let's do something more automated. I'm going to send this to the intruder. I'm going to target this part right here, add it to my first list. I'm going to take that custom word list right here. I'm going to paste it right here and maybe add a payload processing. And I'm going to modify the case. First of all, let's uh, use the lowercase, okay? That, that way we only have lowercase versions. And for the second uh, payload, I'm going to use like Frank, uh, sorry, uh, upload. Um, we will also try with uploads and maybe uploader. Okay, let's start the attack and see if we have our JPEG file back. Going to sort by length and all of them return 404. Okay, let's change this time the, the case for our first word list. And instead of uh, using lowercase, um, let's try uppercase. Okay, start the attack. Ooh, we have something right here. Frank uploads. Oh, okay. And for the, the response, we have indeed our image, which has PHP info at the end. Okay, perfect. Let's uh, go ahead quickly and test if we can, you know, run this PHP info code. Go back to our old beloved request right here. And so we would do var www development uploader. Uh, and then it was Frank upload, uh, Frank uploads, I guess. And then zero dot JPEG. Drum rolls, send, and if we render, holy cow, we have the content of PHP info command executed. You know this means that we've essentially gained remote code execution on the server. So what can we do with it? Well, I can learn more about the server from an inside perspective. And as you can see, we have um, a list of uh, the files, but they are owned by the user Frank. What are we? We are, oh, we are WW data. That's a bummer. We need to escalate our privileges to Frank if we wanted to target that file and change the index.html to a defaced version. Well, the fast thing I can think of is unnamed-a for the version of the kernel. We have a version of 2.6. That's a really old kernel. Let's uh, cat etc release to see the exact version of our distribution here. It's an Ubuntu 10 Maverick. That's a really old box. I think system administration is not this developer's strong suit. So we're going to exploit just that. There's a known exploit that's targeting this exact version of Linux. So I'm going to go to slash TMP and uh, I'm going to paste in the base64 encoded exploit. This exploit right here will give me root access. So let's build it. Uh, first of all, I'm going to decode it. I'm going to put it into an exploit.c file, and then I'm going to build it and run exploit. And voila, we are root. Now I have full power on that web server. I can control development. I can control the index.html. I also see the dot back here. Let's uh, 
run a comfortable shell using Python. Perfect. So with that said, I will look for a scary web page. Let's see. Let's take this one. Copy image address. Now, there are many ways I can deface this website. The simplest one is to replace this file right here. I don't want to be evil. I just want to play with the developer. So I'm going to rename this index.html to index.html. Uh, let's say original.html and this should be enough to scare our developer. Now if I go moment of truth, refresh this page and it has been defaced. If you have been a victim to an attack before, how it went, what are the different things that you think would secure this website even more? Let me know in the comments.